It's Monday, and you know what that means. Another episode of the Religious Studies Project. I'm Brianne Fallon, and with me is... Dave McConaughey. How much did you love last week's discourse episode, Dave? I really loved the episode that we had last week, but I have to admit it's not something I knew much about. What did you think of it? Uh, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's it's really concerning, and uh, I think more people in America should be paying attention to it. It's going to be with us for a long time, and it's really important. If you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about our discourse current events episode about QAnon, and it was a wild ride. And we encourage you to go back and listen to that. This time, we have a really exciting roundtable for you. Uh, it's a really long. Uh, conversation. And part of the reason why it's so long is because there's so many good people that are it was in it. It was organized by Matthew Hayes and it features Michelle Wang, Hannah Gould, Yunmi Kim, and Ralph Craig. It's called Interdisciplinary Approaches to the Study of Buddhist Ritual. Uh, hello, I am Matthew Hayes for the Religious Studies Project. And I'd like to uh, welcome listeners to a roundtable titled interdisciplinary approaches to the study of Buddhist ritual. Uh, I want to begin first by introducing our roundtable participants, uh, and then I'll say some sort of preliminary words about the kind of motivations uh, and the aims of this roundtable. And then I, you know, we can sort of proceed uh, to what I hope is a kind of warm and compelling conversation about uh, disciplinarity in a study of ritual and, and sort of how you all see your work fitting in with the field and the state of the field uh, and so forth. Um, I'd like to first begin uh, by welcoming our first panelist, uh, Michelle C. Wong, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Art and Art History at Georgetown University. Uh, Michelle is a specialist in medieval Chinese art. Her first book, titled Mandalas and the Making, The Visual Culture of Esoteric Buddhism at Dunhuang, uh, examines Buddhist mandalas of the 8th and 10th centuries at the Mogao and Yulin Buddhist cave shrines in northwestern China. Uh, in addition to her research on mandalas, she has also written about art and ritual, miracle tales of animated statues, and transcultural reception of Buddhist motifs and text and image. Um, I would also like to introduce uh, Yunmi Kim, who is Associate Professor of Asian Art History at Iwa Women's University. Uh, prior to joining the faculty there, she was Assistant Professor at Yale University and Assistant Professor at Ohio State University. Uh, she is editor of New Perspectives on Early Korean Art from Shilla to Koryo, a grantee of the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation Research Fellowships in Buddhist Studies in 2018. Uh, she's currently completing her two book manuscripts. Uh, the first is titled Visualizing the Invisible, Liao Pagoda's Cosmology and Body. And the second is titled Ritual and Agency, Visual Culture of Medieval Buddhism in North China. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Hannah Gould, who is a cultural anthropologist specializing in death, technology, and religion. Uh, she recently completed field work within the Buddhist altar and grave industry in Japan, where she examined the emergence and decline of memorial technologies and ritual traditions. Uh, Hannah is currently ARC Research Fellow with the Death Tech Research Team based at the University of Melbourne, uh, studying new body disposal technologies and the future of cemetery design. Uh, and finally, we have Ralph, uh, excuse me, Ralph H. Craig III, who is a PhD candidate in religious studies at Stanford University. Uh, he has written previously on the theological anthropology of Nichiren Shonin. Uh, currently, he is editing the translation of a Tibetan sutra and is under contract to write a religious biography of Tina Turner for the Library of Religious Biography series uh, out on Eerdmans Publishing. Um, wow, this is a... An amazing group, a very, very impressive group. Very happy to be uh, joining you uh, today for a discussion and certainly want to thank you all for being here. Um, I'll just say a kind of a, a preface, I guess, uh, just sort of uh, outlining some of the aims of this uh, conversation. I mean, this, this sort of idea for this roundtable grew out of my uh, occasional frustration, I think, at seeing um, at both a kind of institutional and field-wide uh, level a, a push for interdisciplinarity in the study of religion, but um, 
Also, and, and at the same time, at this sort of individual level, I think a fairly siloed approach, right, by many scholars who tend to kind of stay in their lane in the field. And um, ritual, I think, to me, is one of those religious phenomena that seems to uh, invariably bring scholars together to discuss across these lanes of discipline, right? It sort of involves doctrine and text and uh, materiality and implements and the body and space and architecture and all of these sort of components and, and certainly the kind of broader society to support uh, ritual practice. And so, you know, it, it sort of sits at this nexus between various disciplines and it, and it provides a lot of opportunities uh, for collaboration and um, conversation. So, you know, now uh, in 2020, which has been a strange year, we find ourselves connected more than ever, right, in a kind of virtual way. Um, and so it seemed important and, and appropriate to kind of gather together uh, scholars of various rank and to work within uh, and across the Buddhist tradition to describe their own interdisciplinary experience uh, and to reflect on maybe some of the challenges or maybe some of the promises that this type of work offers scholars interested uh, in, in ritual, okay? Um, to get this sort of conversation started, um, this is the RSP, right, which sort of typically aims to, to take a fairly critical approach to religion and religious studies. And so I wanted to begin by exploring uh, the, the kind of criticality of the term ritual. Um, and I'll sort of frame this question by raising, um, hopefully, a, a work that's known to all of you, a 2005 volume, uh, Critical Terms for the Study of Buddhism. Um, and this book really kind of highlighted maybe a dozen or more terms that were deemed very, very central and, and really uh, important to the study of Buddhism. And the section written uh, on ritual was put together by uh, Robert Scharf of UC Berkeley. Um, there, Scharf draws our attention, I think, to some of the ways that ritual and ritual studies can sort of subvert or confront uh, some of the power dynamics at play within religious uh, communities. He draws our attention to things like play and theatrics and performativity and world building, things like this that tend to kind of undermine uh, some of the more common conclusions that scholars come to using more traditional models of, you know, decades, uh, decades ago. Um, and so I, I thought we might start by thinking about how your work uh, investigates ritual and its component parts, right? Meaning sort of texts and implements and uh, spaces and communities and actors uh, and so forth. And, and how this investigation is critical for you, right? Or sort of what you see in ritual as a critical term. Um, how it might confront or challenge either through your own work or more generally some of these dichotomous experiences that were favored decades ago or power relationships or, or things like this. And um, Ralph, I know you were sort of particularly interested in issues of terminology. I've seen you, you know, discuss this with the Oxford Center uh, um, a few months ago, you know, how we sort of define things like liturgy, how we define terms like ritual. And so I certainly don't want to Put you on the spot, but maybe we can sort of begin here talking about terminology and criticality. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, op opening up to, to everybody, but um, let's begin here if that's okay. Um, well, referencing that 2002 volume, I also see right Carl Bielefeld's article, which comes before the ritual article, right? His article on practice. I see them as kind of going together mm -hmm. in a sense, right? And so, what do we mean? by practice, all right, if we say Buddhist doctrine and practice, um, what is the exact distinction we're drawing and what do we mean with those terms, right? And then putting that together then with Scharf's article, which follows it. Um, so for myself, in my own research, I'm looking at, right now I've kind of turned to looking at this Tibetan text that I'm, that I'm working on. Um, and trying to figure out just what is meant in this text by Bodhisattva ritual, uh, which occurs a couple of times in the text, the phrase occurs. So trying to figure out what exactly the text is, is getting at by saying that. Um, and so we have the Chinese for this text and we have the Tibetan 
and then we have Sanskrit fragments mm. of, of the text that occurred. It's, it's quoted quite frequently by Shanti Deva mm. um, around 24 times or so in the, the Shiksha Samuchaya. So, but I'm trying to figure that out. And so I don't have an answer in that text yet. <laughs> as to what is going on there? But in my own research, I mean, as I as I've discussed before, right? Even going all the way back to the Pratimoksha ritual and this idea of sealing off the sema, right, the ritual boundary of the monastery and all that occurs in that boundary, mm -hmm. um, right? Why those things have to take place therein. And how that then influences later practices and traditions. So I, that's not, I don't have an answer yet for what exactly it means, right? Um, but trying to figure that out, and it, it seems to be directly related to the idea of the Dharma preacher in the text that I'm looking at right now. Um, how they get ready to preach, what's expected of them, seems to have something to do with this bodhisattva ritual. Mm -hmm that that the text discusses um so i'm trying to iron out these terms as we speak sure yeah for me just to give a kind of an analogous uh, uh example here at least uh, maybe to sort of clarify what it is i'm referring to you know in my own uh, work I, i'm trying to kind of illuminate the lay experience right which is typically underrepresented i think in buddhist studies and, and maybe just religious studies generally right you know there, there's a kind of a privileging there of monastic experience and and monastics as kind of producers right but also mm -hmm. consumers mm -hmm. and especially in the case of japan laity is often left out of the conversation um mm -hmm. in, in some ways for good reason and i say that because the materials there are often not written by laity right they're they're written by um educated monastics and so there's a kind of uh, a problem of material access there or, or at least access to texts that can speak to the lay experience and i've worked very hard i think to kind of use ritual as a way uh to to kind of indicate the fact that there was much more commingling uh, in my mm -hmm. period, right in in early modern Japan, in ritual spaces and around ritual spaces, ritual spaces, and um, that is, I, I think, sort of more often the case, right? Than it's sort of given credence in in scholarship. So, uh, Yumi or or Hannah or Michelle, are there any sort of approaches you take to ritual as a critical term, insofar as you might sort of you know um offer audiences representations of otherwise underrepresented or unrepresented uh, groups in your in your work or in your fields or regions yeah, yeah i mean i would say as so i'm an anthropologist and i work in contemporary japan and i think both that that disciplinary background and also the kind of field site really almost predestines me to looking at ritual as a lived practice right, right. and really looking at a grounded approach to ritual as something that people do and experience and it's sensory and it's embodied and that's mm -hmm. the kind of primary material that I look at um, every day. And so, you know, for me, if you think about a kind of practice to doctrine kind of situation, I'm always, as an anthropologist, interested in what might be called the emic perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, looking at the world through someone else's eyes, how do they see ritual and how do they understand it to be effective, what are the conditions that are required? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that, you know, it's often not represented um, through the lay people. I work in a population that it's not only lay people, but it's actually commercial actors. So it's the industry that mm -hmm. supports the lay people's practice and actually operates in between the kind of temple and lay people. And that entire population has just been entirely ignored, mm -hmm. I would argue, from religious right. studies because it's, it's almost outside of that temple lay people nexus it's this entire different group of people and because they're commercial because they want money you know we get a little bit taboo about any kind of intermingling of those things right. but they really have a huge role to play in producing ritual in designing mm -hmm. it in selling it to lay people mm -hmm. um you know you want to worship your ancestors but you're not allowed to leave the house because of covid okay, we've got this taxi company in Japan who will go to your grave and do hakamaidi for you, for mm -hmm. example. And so mm -hmm. there's different kind of populations that through which ritual is born that I think it's only through an interdisciplinary perspective that you kind of understand that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being an anthropologist, that's immediately where I, I went to to design fieldwork. 
but I recognise that that's not where a lot of other disembodied backgrounds would predestine one to, to look at. Mm. And so I think for me, you know, ritual being this huge term that I think really does connect lots of different disciplines, you know, having different kind of perspectives and different scholars that I can draw on to help fill in that picture is really, really important. Mm. And then also recognising where your particular field work and where your particular discipline can contribute, I think has really helped me kind of understand what ritual could be. Mm. Yeah, please just go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, so what you've all been saying actually really speaks to me as well. So my material is quite a bit earlier than Hannah's. Um, I always envious of um, anyone who has the benefit of being able to do ethnographic field work. Um, and um, so I think um, speaking both to the dialogue that we're trying to develop here in the space about interdisciplinarity and then how that pertains to ritual. I would say for the material I work on, uh, which belongs to eight to 10th centuries, um, a site in Northwestern China, Silk Road site, uh, Dunhuang, that this was material that had been um, primarily looked at really through a Japanese scholarly lens. Um, and we have such a rich history of studies of Buddhism and Buddhist ritual in Japan um, by Japanese scholars, in fact, um, by Japanese uh, Buddhist monk scholars of that tradition. And so one of the things that I was trying to uh, really unpack in my work is um, the applicability of that model to phenomena, um, earlier phenomena in Northwestern China in a very different cultural milieu, a very different time period. And one thing that really came to the forefront was that um, the sites that I was looking at, um, so these are man-made caves, um, Buddhist cave shrines that were carved out of living rock, is that we know from the beginning that these were patronized by lay people. So we have paintings of these lay donors and quite a bit of work has been done on that from an art historical perspective, from a social art history perspective. But what really seemed obvious to me was that we also had to look at these lay people, these lay donors um, as patrons of, of rituals, um, as consumers of ritual, um, as Hannah was saying. So, so that's one way in which I think um, the kind of work that I was doing um, really um, maybe uses ritual as a way to introduce interdisciplinarity um, into the study of Buddhist material culture as an art historian. Um, and the type of material that I've been looking at um, not only was, um, uh, had a very deep history of Japanese language scholarship, but um, also was studying in such a way in, in which the images um, were really left inert, in which images of Buddhist deities were categorized. Um, so this is something that we call iconographic studies. Um, and I think also by ring ritual, and not only were we able to acknowledge um, the presence of these lay donors um, and consumers of ritual, um, but also maybe kind of get a sense of how they interacted with, with the images and not just mural paintings and cave shrines, but also um, other objects from the site. So at the site that I work on, um, there were um, over 60,000 manuscripts and portable paintings of woodblock prints that were sealed up inside one of those caves um, sometime in the early 11th century. And it's a rich turbo of material. Um, it's also very challenging to make that material match with the site because many of those manuscripts and paintings um, probably came from freestanding temples in the local city rather than um, having been produced in the caves themselves. But nevertheless, there's a lot of material to work with. And, and um, not only is ritual um, a, a rewarding lens um, through which to examine it, but it also does demand interdisciplinarity because we're looking at visual images in the caves and then we're also looking at the manuscripts um, and also at the Buddhist rituals that are described in them. Michelle, I know that you use the term, uh, it's really fascinating work actually, but I know that you use the term consumer when you were talking about the lay people. And I wonder, you know, as someone who works obviously on religious economics, but I wonder if that, that framing of consumption and production or circulation has been productive, particularly in art history, to kind of place art objects, which might have been looked at kind of more symbolically um, previously, um, but within kind of social political context. I just wonder if that's a shift in art history, looking at it that way. Um, yes, I would say that um, that there is a deep history of looking at um, the consumers of Buddhist art um, from my discipline, from my discipline, art history. Um, and um, 
And I think that's been a really useful tool to look precisely at the, you know, the social cultural context um, in which these objects were made. Um, but I think um, perhaps again, speaking to the things that we're trying to develop here, what I was trying to do was um, to look not only at the immediate cultural context um, in which these case shrines were made and the paintings were produced, um, but also to try to think about the religious context as well. And that's um, very tricky because um, we're talking about, um, We've talked a number of times about how um, it's much harder to capture lay ritual or, or lay practitioners um, as, as actors, um, um, the monastics. Um, and also, again, because of this problem of trying to make this rich treasure trove of manuscripts and formal materials fit with the cage shrines. Um, I think that would actually be a really great question for Yumi to respond to as well, because a lot of her work on um, ritual has um, focused precisely on these um, really elite patrons. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Well, thank you, Michelle. Well, uh, one of my primary uh, uh, research subject is Liao Dynasty pagodas. As you know, Liao Dynasty uh, was a huge empire which ruled uh, large territory in present-day North, Chi North China, Russia, and Mongolia. And uh, during the Liao Dynasty, uh, many imperial patrons built huge pagodas. But uh, at the same time, even though when a pagoda was built by a uh, um, imperial patrons, all the local, uh, uh, local community cooperated together to build a huge pagoda. They chipped in money. Uh, so usually it was, I mean, it was not only the elite patrons, but also lay people uh, participated together to build a pagoda. And um, talking about ritual related to my research, um, well, um, some of the Liao pagodas, especially the Chaoyang Nus pagoda, which I studied for a long time, has a, a relic depository inside it. And what is interesting is that this relic depository is completely sealed space. So after the pagoda was built, no one, no one could enter the building, uh, enter the pagoda, but the relic uh, depository was designed as a ritual altar. And isn't that a little strange mm -hmm. because when we think about a ritual, we tend to think that it's some kind of human action. Mm -hmm. But this ritual altar inside the pagoda did not have any human actant to perform an actual ritual. And, uh, and it happened that when I was a graduate student, my uh, my advisor, Eugene Wang, was interested in the concept of virtual ritual. So we found that this Pagoda Relic Depository was a, was a perfect example for a virtual ritual. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, I thought about how I could explain this phenomenon. So I began to refer to many different kinds of ritual theory, and I found that there was no single definition of ritual that everybody <laughs> agreed on. <laughs> there were so many different kinds of definitions on ritual. Some people say that it's something very dynamic, while some people say it's something very rigid and strict and authoritative. But it seems that almost everyone agrees that it's some kind of human action. But for my case, there was no human action. <laughs> so mm. I, I think now it's time for us to think about the role of non-human actants or material agency. Mm. Because for some cases, uh, including some tombs that was, uh, I mean, the inner space of tombs that was, that was, uh, designed to be a richer space, it's the same thing. There's no human uh, uh, richer actant, but the, but the materials themselves were designed to act as a, a, a material actant, mm -hmm. uh, which could extend the richer efficacy. So um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not attempting to make a new definition of a ritual, but I'm trying to expand 
the extent, the boundary mm -hmm. of the uh, definition of creature. Um, and I think the subset of today's round table was a really, really good choice because ritual is not only a very important uh, uh, concept inside the religious studies, but so many different disciplines, including politics and sociology, mm -hmm. uh, they also use this uh, concept as a very uh, useful framework. I found that there are studies uh, which uh, analyze uh, analyze like American football or a prison, president inaugural ceremony and even physician, uh, physician surgery as some kind of ritual, which I find very interesting. It's really fascinating what you say about the non-human in me, because I mean, mm. not only in Japan, I'm, I'm working kind of where we have funeral ceremonies, rituals, kuyo, kuyo for, kuyokai for inanimate objects, whether that be dolls or eyeglasses or mm in some case bras and like all these different kind of objects. Mm. But I've also recently, I've, I've got a paper coming out uh, soon in the Journal of Global Buddhism that about kind of the limits of ritual efficacy when we think about robots and robotics and AI. Mm. So there's been kind of a few stories recently about kind of Buddhist robots. They often get a lot of popular press kind of, you know, mm. this is the new age. <laughs> but, um, you know, what does it what does it take for a non-human actor to be an effective ritual agent? Mm. Can they perform mm. a funeral ceremony? Can they perform a blessing? You know, what, you know, what are the kind of limits, limitations, whether that be um, a kind of robotic system, an AI system, or even if it be something more like, um, you know, Buddhism on the blockchain. Okay, what does it mm. for an algorithm to perform a mm. Buddhist ritual? And how does that change it? And it's really interesting because in Buddhism, you have this huge historical background of non-human agents being involved mm. in ritual that we can draw on to theorize that, which is what makes it so interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that is so very, very interesting. So when we talk about non-human agencies or non-human actants, now we have to consider robots and AIs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah that's, I, I think this conversation is, is already helpful for me. And just thinking about, I mean, Yumi mentioned this sort of expansion of boundaries. I mean, in many ways, this is precisely what interdisciplinarity is trying to do, right? Whether these are sort of boundaries of, you know, kind of social reception or textual reception or something like this. And, um, you know, in many ways, it's sort of pushing back against this rigidity or this sort of strictness, you know, who, who are the knowledge producers, who are the consumers, as several of you have already sort of mentioned here, right? And being able to kind of widen the scope of things like reception or interaction or production in some cases is I think really one of the kind of, what, what I think of as one of the main missions of interdisciplinary work, you know, trying to kind of push back against some of those, uh, you know, tendencies that have been sort of set up over decades of, of prior study. Um, you know, this is a, actually, I think, a very helpful segue. I think several of you have expressed very sort of common or, or similar perspectives on how you think of ritual as a critical term. And, and in sort of surveying your work individually, um, you know, I notice also there are some sort of common uh, perspectives and angles on your own particular subjects. And um, one of this, one of these sort of commonalities, I think, surrounds um, ritual change, if I'm sort of reading everyone's work, uh, um, you know, acutely. Um, and this could mean, I, I think, in some cases, change in things like visual language, right, of Buddhist iconography. This could mean um, confrontations with modernity, maybe in, in Hannah's case, uh, repurposing of ritual implements or, or sort of the passage of texts across time, across space. Um, and, you know, I sort of thinking of your work together as a whole, um, transformation seems to be, at least at some in, it's to some degree at play there in your work. And so perhaps we could talk a little bit about ritual change as um, a consideration for you as researchers and scholars, right? So why either at a kind of performative level or a material level or textual level or conceptual level, why is change an important consideration in your work, ritual change? And, and why, um, or sort of what does ritual change tell you about maybe the Buddhist tradition or um, performance or the body or space or technology, right? Um, and then maybe as a sort of an additional question, is this something you actively seek out in your work? I know that ritual change is certainly 
not a new consideration for scholars, right? That sort of idea has been around for a while. It's been on the radar for many people working in and around ritual. Um, you know, this is something I've sort of taken into consideration in my own work. It seems like a, a helpful barometer to, to measure some of the things we've been sort of talking about, whether it comes to audience or power, kind of power relationships or reception and things like this. So is this a consideration for you? And if so, sort of what methods do you deploy in your work to consider things like ritual transformation or ritual change? Not everyone at once. <laughs> yeah, I mean, change is a huge aspect of my work. Um, I suppose I explicitly frame my project as a moment of great mm. uncertainty and precarity in Japanese Buddhist um, rituals and particularly rituals around death um, and dying, given kind of the background of huge uh, demographic shifts happening in Japan, mm. um, the breakdown of intergenerational systems of, of ancestor worship and care, Mm. Um, but also kind of a, a more background of, um, you know, things like North Korean missile launches and pandemics mm. and, um, uh, you know, 311, this kind of sense in which death is becoming a part of everyday life and mm. how that can destabilize these kind of ritual systems and traditions that have the last two generations. Mm. I think the one thing for scholars, and I don't know if this is everyone, but the thing about change that is so appealing is that often it's kind of when rituals begin to break down that you can kind of see the component parts or how they work in the first place sometimes it's it's difficult to kind of um kind of understand what makes a ritual effective until something goes wrong right when ritual fails when rich you know um and so uh, change provides this kind of really fascinating kind of almost natural laboratory or testing ground for us to look at. Okay. For an anthropologist in particular, you know, what happened? Why didn't that ritual, what made it effective? Um, you know, what, what, what are the limits of it? What you, you know, would like to do and, um, what could it be and what couldn't it be? Um, yeah. so, you know, I might spend a lot of time talking to people who are trying to design new ways of memorializing, people um, caring for them and, you know, new technologies for incorporating ash, whether that be, you know, putting ash in little jars and keeping it at the home on the butsudan or mm. making it into jewellery or shooting it into space. Like mm. what makes that meaningful, right? What are the limits of what you can do? And sometimes you'll hit kind of a limit or an experimentation or an innovation where all you get as a reaction is, oof, no. And sometimes people can't explain why, right? So, um, mm. for example, I look a lot at, you know, Butsudan, the Buddhist altars that are in the homes, how to dispose of them, how that process happens. And a lot of the time people can't put into words what's right or wrong. But if I suggest something like, okay, so what if I were just to put an old Butsudan out with a trash on the, on the side of the road? Mm. And the reaction you get is just kind of like, ooh, no. <laughs> like, you know, right. And it's embodied. It's effective, right? right? It's like, right. that couldn't happen. And so change provides you this kind of really fascinating test, testing ground to kind of work out these kind of sometimes unspoken rules to ritual mm, mm. Um, and that they only emerge kind of when they're breached. And mm. so if you have this kind of soup of transformation, you can kind of start to kind of see the edges of what ritual mm -hmm. couldn't might be. At least for me, that's why it's so interesting and engaging to do that work. Mm -hmm. I think, Hannah, what you said about unspoken rules is really interesting. I think a lot of that would apply to scholarship as well, to academia. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. um, I would have to say um, ritual change kind of really boiled down to historical changes, but again, kind of these historical moments. I think it's a little hard when you're looking at things from a distance to right. capture what the like, guys moment is. But from the 8th to 10th centuries, what we see in Northwestern China is a period of intense change, um, which we have the Tibetan Empire. Uh, which ruled over Central Asia and, you know, this site in Hong Kong, China, and then um, the fall of the Tibetan Empire, and then the rise of a local government, um, the return to allegiance army, so nominally pledging allegiance to the central Chinese government, central China, but really acting with quite independence, so they increasingly adopted more and more grandiose titles, um, actually calling themselves kings of Jin Hong. And it was actually just kind of a moment where I think I was just looking at the, the dates and the colleges, and I thought, wait, these actually... Um, line up next to one another, you know, what was happening, you know, with, you know, local practitioners, um, you know, in Dunhong and then with the Tibetans. And then that was what led me to notice, um, well, not just change, but maybe parallel changes. Um, mm -hmm. And 
again, that this really kind of boiled down to iconography. So when we're talking about um, esoteric Buddhist rituals, you know, this highly ritualized form of Buddhism with very specific iconographic templates, such as mandalas, um, very um, geometric, um, you know, highly um, diagrammatic representations of Buddhist deities and, and cosmology. Um, what I was seeing was actually the interpolation of of different modular elements. So I think the kind of this idea of kind of breaking down ritual into modular elements uh, really attracts is really attractive to me as well. And um, breaking down ritual into these constitutive, you know, modular elements and kind of seeing where um, what we recognize as highly ritualized esoteric forms of Buddhism, those modular elements with maybe things that were not conventionally considered to be part of that tradition, mm. how they were being fitted together in very interesting, I think, innovative ways, um, I thought was quite interesting, maybe kind of pushing back against, you know, these distinct categories, right? these categories that we've respected for a very long time. Mm. And um, so I think for me, it's really interesting to think of um, um, maybe the mechanics underlying ritual, you know, how do you do it? How do you put things together? And then when are these moments that can trigger a great change? Because going back to um, the 9th to 10th century, so this is a period in which we see a lot of independence among the local. Um, so we basically see a lack of, let's say, central centralized political authority, right? We have this very um, independent local government in Hong. And then um, this also coincides with what's been called the dark age of uh, Tibetan history in which, um, um, there was um, kind of a gap between the first and second transmission of Buddhism in which um, uh, scholars who focus on Tibetan Buddhism believe that there was a great deal of, of ritual innovation precisely because of the lack of centralized government control of, of Buddhist rituals. And so, so it seems to me that maybe during this historical period that it was right for um, maybe experimentation and, and maybe localized forms of Buddhism that um, were really designed to fit the needs of, of local lay devotees um, mm -hmm. rather than the monastic elite. And I was intrigued by the question raised about how do you know when, when what's effective? How do you know what's efficacious? Um, and I wonder if that has to do with, um, especially since we're talking about changes over time, with maybe what gets carried forward, um, you know, what is transmitted. And I was actually wondering if, if Ralph, is, if that's something you've seen yeah. in your work, because you're yeah. dealing with um, different sources, some of them fragmentary, and that's something I find so fascinating and, and challenging as well. So you're working not just interdisciplinarily, but really across you know languages and, and cultural yeah. traditions. Yeah, uh, I think, I mean, one of the things that came to mind as you were speaking is, right, in many Indian texts, right, in many Sanskrit texts, you have the section called the Palashruti, right, which is the, the hearing of benefits, literally the hearing of the fruits, right? Uh, so the, the benefit that is to be gained from either engaging in reciting the text itself or doing what the text enjoins you to do. Mm -hmm. And how these polishrutis change over time, right? How in different uh, editions of a text, you'll see different polishrutis. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many ways, right, to think about that. One scholar, Florinda Dissimony, right, in her book of gods and um, of gods and books, right, she discusses the Palashruti extensively, um, and she doesn't discuss it in these terms. But now, because of your question, uh, Michelle, I'm thinking about how these Palashruti change, um, how the expectations of efficacy and of what the text can do and what its benefit will be to you, right? So um, right, the text may say, engaging in the text, right? You can bring rain and end the drought, right? You see this in like a lot of Dharani texts. But then when that text is copied and used in another text, right? Parts of Dharani texts are often used in other texts the kind of rainmaking part will be dropped or the, uh, you know, the kind of the uh, part about childbirth will be dropped and inserted in that part will be something else. And is that because the geography has changed, right? The rain is not so much an issue mm -hmm. in this new environment. Right. Um, is it transmissional error? right? The, the part of that text is just missing, right? We're working with these fragments. It's not always clear why a part is missing, mm. um, mm. but it often seems more deliberate than not. And so I think you're absolutely right. And in my own work in particular, I see it 
in these hearing of benefit sections, mm. um, which are relatively understudied. I mean, they're they're acknowledged, right? They're they're a part of almost every text we look at. Um, so many scholars mention these texts, uh, these portions of text, these palashruti, but scholars, some scholars are just now starting to think about what they actually do. Um, and that then entails looking at these changes mm -hmm. um, and including the text I'm working on right now, uh, the Dharma Sangiti Sutra the, in Tibetan, the Chiyang Dakpar Duba. It has this very long, I would argue, a solid fourth of the text is Palashruti. Mm -hmm. um, but some parts of that, that's more toward the end, right? So the kind of like the, the last fourth of the text. But portions of that uh, portions of that don't occur in the Chinese. Um, some of the significant benefits. So when I was reading through the Tibetan just to preliminarily see what was there, I was I get excited by these kinds of things. I was like, "Ooh, you do you do the text and you get this and you have a beautiful body and it'll be great. Who doesn't love a beautiful body, right?" But that is not in the Chinese. Um, and right, we're we're just now starting our work to see if if that's because it wasn't original to the text that you know we're trying to cross reference to see if that parts of that section come from somewhere else um or if our man you know our problems with our manuscript which mm -hmm. of course is is possible mm -hmm. uh, well uh ralph brought out uh brought up a very important issue i think the uh the relationship between action ritual practice and uh, ritual manual, for example, and the reasons why certain ritual or believed efficacy of Dharani changes. Uh, well, some of my uh, research is also related to it, similar kinds of uh, questions. Um, and I, I, uh, I find that, I mean, there are many different reasons for certain changes in the ritual, but one of the reasons uh, was related to practical reasons. What I mean is that sometimes people might think that uh, some aspects or every aspects of a ritual should have some symbolic, very important symbolic meaning, mm. but, but some of them changes because of practical, not symbolic, but practical reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, what I, uh, I want to uh, talk about is a uh, uh, Korean Buddhist ritual known as Bokjang. Uh, this Bokjang ritual is a rite in which um, certain monks uh, prepared very special ritual object to be enshrined inside a Buddhist statue to enliven the statue when they make the statue. Um, and based on uh, materials excavated from inside Buddhist statues, we know that such ritual was practiced at least since uh, 13th or 12th century in Korea. Uh, but what is interesting is that the ritual manuals, uh, which explains about the ritual, uh, survives only uh, from the from the late 16th century, and we have uh, at least seven different editions for that ritual manual known as Chosangyong in Korean. Uh, and when Korean scholars compare uh, actual objects excavated from statues and compare them with these ritual manuals, what we find is that uh, sometimes it was uh, ritual practice itself that changed it first, and then people later reflected that changes, those changes in, in a new edition of ritual manual. And some of the uh, changes uh, uh, happened because of practical reasons. For example, uh, in the late 18th century, Buddhist paintings in Joseon, Korea began to change from hanging scroll 
uh, into uh, frame, uh, frame, uh, framed format. I mean, people began to uh, mount Buddhist paintings using uh, wooden frames. And uh, uh, also what is in interesting is that in Joseon, Korea, people also did similar pokjang ritual uh, for Buddhist paintings. But because paintings uh, do not have inner space. What people did was they prepared a special pouch and enshrined a relevant object in, inside the pouch and hung it above the painting. Mm -hmm. But when the uh, mounting format changed from hanging school into, uh, uh, into framing, uh, people changed this ritual. So instead of making pouch, they made uh, a square box uh, which enshrined a uh, similar object and then and then uh, attached the box behind behind the painting in, uh, in order to enliven the painting. So what uh, made that change was not symbolic reason but this practical change that happened with the uh, material shape of the painting itself. And mm -hmm. the change of that was reflected in the later version of Chu Sangyong or, or the ritual manual. Mm. Uh, yeah. okay. And can I say one more thing? Please, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Last month, I was actually in, uh, I was staying at a local Buddhist monastery mm. in the mount mountainous area in Korea. Uh, I mean, I, uh, participated in a special program in which we uh, we went to, uh, how to say, we lived like a, a monk mm. or uh, nuns for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And the program was super strict. And then there were <laughs> four, <laughs> there were uh, three monks and one, uh, one nun who supervised us. And then uh, during the program, what we found most difficult was eating ritual. Mm. <laughs> we called it paru kongya. And then for every meal, there were so many details we have to follow in order to have this meal. Uh, it was so strict. And then, uh, and then this nun first taught us how to do this ritual. There were uh, quite a few different taranis and mantras we have mm. to recite for, uh, for uh, during this meal time. And also there were mudras. But then we found that uh, the ritual that none was keeping for many years was actually different from what, uh, what her colleague monks were doing. Mm. And they did not know that their monasteries had different rituals. Mm -hmm. They just thought that they were sharing the same meal ritual, but they found from this program, they found that they were actually doing a little different uh, rituals. Mm -hmm. So I found, so I think in that way, without, without noticing sometimes ritual develops into different ways and then it slowly, slowly changes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes practitioners do not recognize those changes. Yeah. I really love this conversation. Sorry, just to, because no, I yeah. think particularly like to talk to people who are more kind of maybe historically minded um, mm -hmm. than, than kind of anthropologists can sometimes be, because uh, I think we have a kind of a significance bias sometimes right. in, in studying ritual and religion, where, where as you said, Yungmi, like, you know, this change must have occurred because it's important or symbolic right. or, you know, but, you know, as, as you've all talked about, you know, sometimes it's environmental factors or political factors mm. or just chance or just variation. Mm. And um, I think of the work of uh, Ruth Tolson, who works mm. uh, in Singapore in Singapore uh, funerary ritual. And she says that, you know, sometimes the things that remain are actually the things that are the least important because mm. they're the things that impose the least amount of burden on people to continue. And mm. we kind of assume that, like, as rituals change, it's always the most important core or heart part of that ritual that will remain but often that's not it's not often not the case mm -hmm. so yeah i'm really just enjoying these kind of yeah. one's historical so what, approach to it i, I was just going to say one thing that sort of uh, got me thinking just in hearing each of you speak is is how central human actors are to all of your work whether or not it's modern or pre-modern right mm. and 
I suspect maybe more so for somebody like Ken. I mean, you're, you're sort of doing ethnography, right, in a sort of, in, in a very active way. And I mean, if anything, just to kind of ask a practical question, 2020 has revealed itself to be a year of change and a year of dysfunction, right, in many, in many ways. And so um, thinking about those of you who have to be on site, right, to conduct your research, or those of you who need to have an, a dialogical relationship or at least an interactive relationship with your subjects, um, what sort of new obstacles or challenges or sort of, you know, just kind of practical problems have arisen for you? Or, or what sort of problems do you anticipate even arising next year, right? So this is a very uncertain time with this kind of global health crisis. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about a difficulty you've had or some difficulties you've had in, in your pursuit of data or materials or, or anything. Um, maybe we can start with you, Hannah, just because I know what this is probably the most... Uh, <laughs> question oh, for 2020. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just all the problems, all the challenges. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but I'm based in Australia and uh, we've been relatively lucky in terms of our COVID response, but we're also very uh, proactive. Uh, so uh, I'm not allowed to leave the country and my university won't let me go overseas to do research. Um, you know, they won't give me insurance or anything. I'm not allowed to leave my house for more than an hour at the moment. So a uh, trip to Japan to do some research is not really on the cards. Um, so it's been a weird year for me, both because, you know, COVID has stopped me doing, obviously, you know, traveling to Japan and doing any kind of, you know, in, in person fieldwork, but also because, I mean, COVID is about death and I study death mm. ritual and death ritual change. So, you know, already academics kind of blur their scholarship and their work. My, you know, my, all my Facebook feeds, all of my social media feeds have been from some of my participants, interlocutors in the field, mm. um, you know, people working at funeral homes. We got our first COVID death today. How, mm. did, you know, how did they react to that? Um, and, you know, for me, some of that has been, I've been able to kind of switch to doing some field work in Australia and looking at kind of responses, lo more local responses within religious communities to mm. death and dying and, and, and kind of the restrictions around COVID. Um, mm. We only have 10 people per funeral service here in Australia. There's like quite mm. a strict limit and mm. lots of differences about body preparations and body handling and embalming. Mm. Um, and some of that has been trying to be active on social media and following news reports from Japan and, and kind of calling up my my participants and asking them how they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, as an anthropologist, I think I'm always so focused on, you know, interviewing people and being there on the ground. I don't always give enough time to kind of uh, explore texts. And, and actually COVID has maybe given me a chance to kind of try out some new kind of more textual, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, methodologies that mm -hmm. I think, uh, it's not my training. And so it's an interesting kind of uh, way for me to kind of start exploring those issues um, and see how it's written about and work more with, with uh, kind of textual materials. Um, so it's, it's, it's both like a really difficult time to be conducting field work. And also it's like the most important time right. for me to be engaging right. with the subject matter because right. COVID has totally transformed how death's happening. Right. Yeah, I know in the case of uh, Japan, and I, I suspect elsewhere also, there, there are now these kind of distanced funerary rites, right? These kind of distanced memorials and things like this. And so my immediate question to somebody like you, who, as you say, kind of uh, needs to be on site, or at least, you know, ideally wants to be there with people, is there such a thing as a kind of distanced ethnography or a virtual ethnography or a way for you to kind of access you know, the data or the people or the kind of events in a way, in, in sort of the same ways that they are evolving in real time in 2020 in this kind of virtual proxy sort of distanced way. Yeah, I think, I think the first thing for an anthropologist is the kind of the shape of your ethnography is always driven by the shape of what people are experiencing. Mm -hmm. So if people mm -hmm. are a lot more online today and they're attending funerals through Zoom, then you need to be online and right. you need to be on Zoom. And even if I were in Japan, not doing that aspect of it would, would kind of betray what's happening in the ground. Um, mm -hmm. The other interesting thing, I suppose, is that a lot of the trends that have been happening in Japanese death culture towards, for example, smaller family rituals, smaller funerals that don't maybe involve, you know, extended families or companies, <laughs> um, but, you know, are with, you know, one monastic perhaps and just a small family. They have actually been happening for a long time. So when COVID hit, 
you know, in some ways it's just exacerbated changes that have been going on right. for quite a while, as opposed to kind of completely revolutionizing them. And I think that's also really interesting because, you know, and, and also, you know, cremation and all these kind of new ways of, of dealing with ashes, it shows that, you know, it's not always a huge revolution. You know, it can just be kind of an, a slower, more evolution towards things that have already been going on. And I think, mm-hmm. so yeah, ethnography from afar is, is kind of my, my daily bread and butter at the moment. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm lucky to have enough of my participants in Japan who, who want to update me. And, you know, I'm able to get kind of source materials from Japan sent to me. So mm-hmm. it's, it's certainly challenging in 2020. I'd love to be there, but uh, hopefully 2021 I'll be able to, to go back. Mm-hmm. And in the case of Michelle and Yuni and, and Ralph, and I suspect myself as well, I mean, we're largely relying on things like digitization of, you know, archival materials or texts or, uh, you know, facades and things like this. But are there any other considerations, Michelle or Yuni or Ralph, that you are maybe have to take into consideration nowadays or maybe looking forward in your, your work? I suspect the impact may not be as dramatic as it is for Hannah, but uh, anything for you in this way? Well, one, oh, I'm sorry, were you about to say something on the show? Oh, go ahead, Ralph. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, it's true that I, I largely work on, on text and, right, so not having access to collections and until recently, for example, the Stanford Library, right, which, which and also the East Asia Library, which is a part of it, uh, which I relied on pretty heavily for my work. Um, I haven't been able to access that but more importantly for me has been the inability to have the spontaneity that I didn't really realize yeah. my research required. But I drew a lot from uh, overhearing conversations informally or just being around some of my colleagues or uh, other departments, for example, at Stanford, uh, and just kind of going to colloquium and some of the things that they're doing where, and I've drawn a lot of inspiration from that. Um, looking at the Dharma preachers in this particular text, for example, Dharma Bonicas, that came from overhearing a conversation um, in AFAM. At, Stanford doesn't have an AFAM department, but I was thinking about my own background in New Orleans and, and all of that, thinking about the paper, that the article that I wrote on Nietzsche and kind of Christian symbol and all of that. And then I overheard this conversation at a colloquium that I was at. And it, they seemed to be saying a number of things that I was also seeing in the text that I was looking at. And so that is actually what inspired me to look at this text in the first place and started this whole kind of uh, research project that I'm on right now. And then AAR and these kinds of conferences, just kind of interacting with various scholars and not having that, right? Or even to do something like this, where it has to be scheduled. I have to think it's something that has to occur. So I have to reach out. And then it takes, right, when I was teaching online uh, last quarter, and obviously, of course, will be for the, for the foreseeable future, um, everything is so scripted and scheduled right. that I'm not having the kinds of spontaneous interactions that um, have been central to my work thus far. Mm. And I'll adjust, you know, I mean, you have to. <laughs> But that is something that has changed my research. Um, and then my project on Tina Turner, obviously she's a living figure and I was supposed to be in Switzerland doing research um, related to the book that I'm writing on, on her, right? She's a Swiss citizen now and she lives in Switzerland. And all that went out the window. <laughs> oh, um, right. And all the people that I was, a, a few of the people I was supposed to meet with uh, some of them refuse to meet over Zoom. They feel that they can't have the kind of interaction that they want to have over Zoom. And so that shelved that whole uh, aspect of my project. Mm. I, do, um, I do agree that I think with just COVID and the schedule of things, we're all being forced to be a lot more goal-driven, I think, than we might otherwise have been. There's kind of a loss of maybe serendipity um, and the kind of casual encounters that you might have in, in conferences. So I find that I actually missed that quite a bit. Um, so the Zoom, I think coffee hours don't really quite compensate for all that. And it's challenging, I think, especially when you're participating in um, international conferences where 
Um, it's a lot harder to bridge, I think, the linguistic divides and the kind of casual conversations you might have. Um, mm. Scholars, um, you know, speaking your second and third languages, and that's a little harder, I think, to sustain over Zoom. I would say um, there's something that Hannah mentioned oh, that made me wonder. So you were saying that, you know, ethnography is shaped by the lived experiences of your, your, your colleagues, your, you know, your, your subjects. And, and it kind of makes you wonder, maybe for those of us who are pre-modernists, and we've talked about, you know, moments of crises and, and change, right? Whether there was anything like that going on. And if so, where would we look for that material? I mean, so let me just leave that out there. It was a very strange random thought that popped into my mind. Mm. Um, speaking of lack of serendipity, um, speaking to digitization, um, you know, one thing I'll say is that, um, so um, I'm uh, kind of, I've been working on uh, with the International Dunham Project uh, with the postdoctoral fellow, uh, uh, Miki Morita, and then with staff at the British Library, um, uh, Louisa Mingoni and uh, Melody Dumi, and in the, in the cataloging and digitization of uh, Silk Road artifacts in North America, which hadn't been done systematically before. And I would say that as much of a boon the digitization has been for those of us who work with pre-modern materials, especially manuscripts, that um, the production of new digitization has slowed down considerably because we're talking about libraries and museums where people are on furlough, where there's a great deal of uncertainty and people are working at home and actually not having access even to those um, primary sources in order to digitize them. So, and I think also maybe just a final thought is that um, for anyone working um, in China studies, I think the COVID crisis is also intertwined with, I think just what's happening in terms of US-China relations, especially in this election year. So there's been a lot of uncertainty about that, a lot of things that um, I think throw into question um, what uh, our scholarly collaborations with colleagues in China will look like going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a great, and, and I think a, a great sort of um, segue, I mean, many of you have mentioned these sort of, some of the obstacles in making contact, establishing contact with people, maintaining relationships, not only with your subjects in the case of Hannah, but also just other scholars. I mean, Ralph, I appreciate this perspective on spontaneity. I mean, I think uh, I can absolutely agree with you. Some of the most exhilarating moments for me, both as a graduate student and now as a kind of a fresh PhD have been um, those moments where you encounter something when you least expect it, right? Those are the kind of moments that I think we all really appreciate. And absolutely, when we fall into this kind of mundane, you know, uh, very, very scheduled, highly kind of, uh, you know, standardized routine every day, it becomes very, very difficult to uh, seek out, you know, something obscure or chase down something that maybe you know, otherwise wouldn't be worth your time, you know, spending two hours chasing something down. And so it makes it very, very difficult. And, and perhaps we could spend the last few minutes here talking about some of the kind of practical challenges, but also maybe some of the approaches you take to establishing networks across disciplines, whether that's across departments or across methodological lines or uh, across, you know, borders, right, in a kind of a physical sense, um, not only for 2020, but also just sort of looking forward um, in your own work and, and sort of how you envision yourself maintaining some degree of interdisciplinarity with all these sort of challenges that are that are arising. And, and perhaps we can sort of uh, finish here. Uh, maybe, maybe Yunmi, if you don't mind, would you mind uh, sort of starting here? Of course not. Uh, yeah. Well, my primary field is history of arts and I have been trained inside my own field but at the same time I have uh, a lot of uh, I mean yeah a lot of um, intellectual exchanges with scholars in the field of Buddhist studies mm. uh, so um, for me it was kind of very natural that I began to have many commun communications with them and then I'm also uh, uh, participating in the uh, Frug Bear project, which oh, is, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that project has many uh, scholars of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, studies, but at the same time, it also has uh, quite a few art historians, including myself and Michelle, <laughs> who is in our uh, around the table together and I think this kind of um, how to say interdisciplinary uh, big project really helps us to uh, make 
truly inter interdisciplinary um, researchers. Um, and uh, I, uh, I want to add a little bit more comments on this 2020 situation. Yeah. Well, because of this uh, spreading epidemics, I have been really frustrated, but at the same time, I see some kind of, how do I say, uh, some kind of good effects as well. Mm. Uh, what I mean is, uh, for example, uh, next year in March, uh, the Art History Association of Korea is planning to have a big international conference. Mm. But at the moment, it seems that we have to do it online. Um, we are changing our plans. Uh, so I was a little bit disappointed because I couldn't really physically invite all these, my uh, old colleagues and uh, famous scholars. But at the same time, what is good is that we will uh, make this uh, online conference available online so that everybody could, everybody can watch the conference and ask questions, which make it more democratic, I would say, because anyone around, I mean, anyone around the world doesn't need to buy air, airplane ticket to come to Korea to attend the conference and listen to the lectures of these scholars. So it became free for everyone. And it's, uh, it also, I mean, helps, I believe that this kind of uh, online conversations in the future will help many small institutions in various worlds uh, to, to have international, to uh, host international conferences more easily because it reduces uh, costs. So, I mean, it, I mean, this current situation obviously has many frustrations and disappointments, but at the same time, it has some, some level of positive effects as well. Mm. And same for the museum exhibitions. My field is art history, so I have many uh, exchanges with museum traders. And some museums require, I mean, some museums have very expensive I and mean, relatively expensive museum tickets. But nowadays, uh, museums began to have, began, uh, began to offer more online exhibitions and online educations, and many of them are free and open to everyone. And so it, 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 is, it is making some positive uh, effects. But at the same time, I'm hoping that the world will uh, return to normal. Yes. Because <laughs> I planning to bring my graduate students to Sichuan province in China last mm. February. Mm. Got cancelled. So my students are so <laughs> disappointed. Well, I think yeah, one just, thing. Oh, yeah, please oh, go sorry. ahead. No, please go oh, ahead, sorry, Ralph. Sorry, I just wanted to, to uh, kind of build upon what, what Yumi was just saying, right? And also circle back to the question you asked about ritual change. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you know, Matthew, some of my work is about liturgy and looking at kind of liturgical practices and, and texts, right? And that fundamentally, liturgies tell you who to be, right? They create subjects, they describe kinds of subjects as well. And so right, there's always this question of what is what is this liturgy telling us about, about the subject, um, either who it envisions participating, or if you're lucky enough to maybe enhance this case, if you're lucky enough to have actual people doing something, <laughs> right, then to have actual conversations about that. And so that n now in these COVID times, right, it's, it's like, who are we being asked to be as scholars, right, as researchers? Um, and, and I think that's an open question, right? I don't think it's, I think uh, like Yunmi was just saying, one of those things we're being asked to be is to be more open, right? Mm -hmm. To be more accessible with our research, right? Because on a fundamental level, that's, that's how we can share across these platforms. And some of my favorite resources like BDRC mm -hmm. um, and some of these kinds of database sites have during this time totally revamped their interfaces to make them mm -hmm. more accessible and easy to use. Right, in acknowledgement of the fact that many people are accessing this material now digitally. Um, but that then also, 
addressing, for example, in the US, right, we had during what was spring quarter for me, um, I was co-teaching my, uh, ex my exploring Buddhism class, which is basically an intro to Buddhism class. But at the same time, there was all of this unrest happening around you know, racial issues in the United States and all of this. And f trying to find a way each class session to address that, some of our students were kind of living in areas that were kind of hard hit by protest and unrest, right? Uh, and then being on Zoom at the same time as all of this was happening. Right. So trying to discuss that and deal with that, but also get through, you know, the, our kind of fifth century material, which is not directly related, not, you know. Right. Um, and so it's, it's been asking of us to be different in some way. And that's a kind of ritual change, right? That's my point. Um, in many ways, it's, oh, it's yeah. actually asking us to be interdisciplinary, right? It's asking us exactly. to kind of reach across disciplines and maybe uh, put a foot in, you know, other issues that we don't commonly put a foot in exactly. uh, when we're working on fifth, fifth century Indic texts all the time, right? So uh, exactly. absolutely, very, very similar experiences for me, spring quarter, I looked at materials that I think spoke, I think more so to social issues, right? These were issues in pre-modern Japan, in my case. But as, a, as an instructor, right, it, I felt a kind of responsibility to bridge those those worlds together, and it and it and it seemed effective, right? So students were were sort of they had their dials turned way up during that during those moments, and I think they were sort of more receptive to uh, that type of flexibility and sort of nimbleness when it comes to disciplines and excavating some of those harder issues that were very very visceral for for many of them at that time around the spring and, and still mm -hmm. are certainly. So yeah. yeah, that's 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 a helpful comment, yeah. We could also, um, I'd actually like to follow up on what you just said, Matthew, about thinking about maybe the burdens or um, the expectations placed on scholars in different disciplines or how different disciplines are responding to the COVID crisis. Because, um, you know, as you know, there's been a lot of great material produced by our colleagues in, in religious studies and Buddhist studies that we're all planning on using um, this fall when we teach. And I think there maybe the focus is more on, on education or public education, public scholarship. And I feel like I'm seeing actually very different expectations placed on the art world, where the focus is more on maybe um, maybe kind of a, a diversion or um, you know healing. Um, it's it's a very different kind of rhetoric actually, which I find really interesting. And we've kind of talked about maybe the transactional or maybe consumerist aspects of Buddhist ritual a couple of times on during this conversation. And and I think that if Let's say if a Buddhist ritual were to be carried, a religious ritual were to be carried out even remotely, you know, even over Zoom, we would expect there to be some sort of transactional aspect of it, right? Um, it wouldn't be carried out for free. But right. at the same time, there is increasing expectation that museum-related digital programming, you know, when we take this online, that it will be free. Mm. And I don't think mm. this is kind of a long-term model. Um, right. And I was. Yeah. Um, I just finished correcting proofs for a co-authored article um, that's coming out from the Museum Journal, and I didn't hear from um, the staff of the journal for a long time, and I was afraid to reach out because I was generally terrified that they, they lost their jobs. I mean, I just didn't know what was going on. And so, so I find the rhetoric really interesting. That's actually something that, um, since a couple of us have talked about teaching and how we're trying to bring this to life for our students, um, as well as for one another as, as academics, um, so I'm actually teaching a class this fall on art and crisis and kind of speaking about oh. how um, the pandemic is affecting not just our research, but also our teaching. Originally, I was slated to teach a course on Zen art and realized that it would have been quite impossible to do, just given the uncertainty of library access, where my students were going to be, um, uncertainty about when museums were going to open, so on and so forth. And so, and one of the things that um, students are really keen on looking at is really the response of the art world and, and artists um, to, to the pandemic and, and kind of maybe unpacking this idea of the healing power of arts during the pandemic. And I find it ironic because, um, you know, we, um, a number of us talked about Dharanis and we know about, you know, the ways in which Buddhist rituals can be aimed at healing, um, you know, that sort of efficacy, but, um, but increasingly, it seems to me that we're thinking about um, expectations of religious studies scholars versus maybe the art world. It seems to me that maybe more of the burden of the expectation of healing has been placed onto the art world rather than mm. on studies, if that makes sense. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Any, um, I just sort of, I want to get uh, Hannah in here as well. Just any thoughts for you, Hannah, on sort of disciplinary expectations, as Michelle just described, or the sort of burden, or alternatively, you know, network building and some of the sort of challenges for reaching across disciplines in light of some of these burdens, I think, that are emerging for for some of you. Yeah, I mean, being an anthropologist in, in Australia, there's a, you know, uh, religious studies as a discipline is not really a discipline in Australia. It's it's kind sure. of never been. Um, so people who work in religion tend to be trained in different social sciences disciplines. Um, and then there's the added kind of, I suppose, relationship between the U.S. and Australia where, you know, there is a tendency for U.S. academics, I don't think I'll offend anyone, to, you know, position the U.S. as the academic core in the English-speaking world. And, mm-hmm. and you know, like some of these big conferences like AAR and the AAA, for example, really represent themselves as kind of, you know, the core, number one most important place where religious studies is happening or where anthropology is happening. And so um, being a scholar who, who, you know, doesn't work in, in that job market and in that kind of discursive space you have to do more work to engage with with u.s scholarship and and for australians in particular you know geographically we just travel this is part of you know how we do our jobs and so australian academics you know we'll go to maybe two or three international conferences every year almost all of our conferences will be international because that's how we engage with different academic communities and we also get to engage with both the UK and the US and Europe and Asia. And I think that really, actually because we don't see Australia as the core, it actually allows us to kind of speak to lots of different organizations and different and different kind of scholarships. And actually I think that's an enriching aspect because mm. you know, it's part of our habitus, it's part of our ritual to right. travel to different academic communities and kind of force yourself to engage and forge relationships that might otherwise have been made for you by graduate connections or uh, you know supervisory connections and that sort of thing like it's it's kind of more of an active process of creating relationships Mm. and for anthropologists in particular for a discipline that really seeks to contribute to contemporary debate and discourse Mm. um you know if if kind of the healing aspect is being put onto the art world then i think anthropologists have felt a lot of um burden or, or a lot of responsibility to being actively engaged and to pivot towards not only the COVID kind of crisis, but also, um, you know, Black Lives Matter in America, but also the kind of resonances that that has in Australia for the kind of indigenous Australian Mm -hmm. rights movements and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have, you know, attempted to pivot their research and that has placed burdens on different people because of just how academic life is structured. Um, I know that we've already seen kind of declines in single journal authored submissions from women who have caring responsibilities. You know, we've seen journals find it hard and harder to, to get reviewers um, and to kind of be able to maintain that level of, of academic um, performance. So it's, it's been quite a, a bit of a, a existential crisis for anthropologists in a lot of ways because the main bread and butter of going out and just hanging out and talking to people and uh, traveling the world is, is unable to be done. But at the same time, it's reminded us that, you know, um, you kind of have to be really active and, and put yourself into conversation, whether that be via social media or via engaging a lot more on kind of disciplinary debates and, and, you know, email lists, et cetera. Mm. Um, that's something you kind of have to practice and have to become a new rhythm of your working life. Right. Well, maybe, forging relationships in the light of academic burden is a perfect place to end this conversation. Um, Wonderful perspective. This, this conversation took turns I hadn't anticipated. It was quite exciting for me um, and also felt very, very timely, much more timely than I think I had anticipated as well. So, um, I want to thank all of our participants, uh, Michelle, Yunmi, Ralph, and Hannah. Thank you very much for your time uh, and for your effort. It was wonderful to chat with you. Uh, and I hope to see you around, uh, maybe on a screen again or maybe in person uh, someday. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I learned so much that I didn't really know about how these different disciplines approach ritual. It was really refreshing. Today, though, with this extra long episode, Bree and I are not going to have our usual chat. Instead, we just want to to wish you all the best right now and hope that you're staying safe and healthy and uh, and and prepare you for what's coming next time. So what do we have on the docket next time, Bree? Next week, we have an episode 
which was filmed across the interwebs as they all are at the moment, but very much so. We had our interviewer, Maxine Connolly Panagopoulos in Greece, and our interviewee, Kathleen Openshaw here in Australia, and they discussed navigating stasis and mobility, the journey of anointing oil. Until then, all that's left to say is thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. The RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash projectrs and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals.